I'm just coming back from a long sabbatical, and I have missed you. But what I've missed the most is chapel, getting together a couple times a week and singing God's word back to them, being able to preach to one another, to hear and sit under uh, God's word every week. So I'm very glad to be back. And I've been here 15 years, and I'm going to do something I've never done before. I want to share with you, ready, a dream I had last night. <laughs> I've never, I don't share, I don't remember my dreams, and I never share them. But as the alarm went off really early this morning, I was having a dream. And I want to share that dream with you and then uh, pray about it, actually. In the dream, I was living in Wilkinsburg in a house that isn't mine, but it had a great big living room, probably as big as this chapel. And as the dream uh, was coming to an end in my living room, there were about a hundred young people and half were black and half were white. And we were praying together and I, I saw these faces and I don't know who these young people were, but we were praying together and holding hands. And I remember saying to my wife, this is one of the happiest days of my life as the alarm went off. And uh, I'd like to pray about reconciliation here in the seminary. And may we be a place of reconciliation. Um, we don't need to hold hands. But uh, uh, may we uh, join our voices together in praising God, whether we're white or black um, or Chinese. And uh, let's bow our heads for a minute before we open God's word. Our Father in heaven, uh, the United States stands so divided. And as we've been reminded, uh, the United States stands separated from China as well. We ask in Jesus' name that uh, those things that divide us might be taken away. That we as a nation might bow the knee to our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, make each one of us in this room to be an ambassador for the good news of Jesus Christ and how there's neither male nor female, neither black nor white, as we all um, find ourselves to be fellow servants of the risen Lord. May uh, our PTS be a place where that is modeled. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Preaching always comes from biography. This weekend we have the Westminster Conference and all of us in the faculty have been thinking about sanctification. And I wanted to share a passage that's important for the lecture that I'm going to have on Friday night. And I won't be able to uh, do exegesis in the lecture, so I thought we'd do it today in chapel. Turn with me in God's Word to Romans chapter 8. We'll only read uh, verses 12 to 17. We really should read the first 11 verses, but uh, scan them while I'm preaching. And let's read together from the ESV, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This ends our reading from God's word. Let's bow our heads again. Our Father in heaven, you have given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit this word, we ask by that same power that you would speak. Amen. This passage describes us. Look with me at verses 12 and 13 and the last part of 17. It describes how we walk. 
And Paul, in the beginning of our chapter, in the first 11 verses, has laid before us the massive change that has occurred in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now we have a transition. Verse 12 begins with the phrase, so then. As Dr. Kinnear will tell us, when Paul begins with the so then, he's telling us, okay, I'm basing what I'm saying in 12 on 1 through 11. So then. So the theme is our walk, and the contrast is between the Christian walk, which is in life, and the pagan walk, which is in death. Let's take a look at the nature of a walk in life and a walk in death. The Christian, Paul says in 12 and 13, walks in life and the unbeliever in death. And the difference between these two walks is crystal clear. If you walk according to the flesh, you will die. On the other hand, if you walk according to the spirit, then you will live. So what is the mark for us as Christians of walking according to the spirit? That's the person who puts to death the deeds of the body. And here the word body is synonymous with the word flesh. And Paul connects this walking in the spirit and putting to death the deeds of the body with Christ and his sufferings. The opening verses connect to 17b, and, he, and Paul makes what we would call a bookend. He opens verses 12 and 13. He closes with the last part of 17b, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So the first step of the Christian walk is walking in death to the flesh. And Paul wants us to understand how our suffering with Christ while walking in death to the flesh fits the overall pattern of the Christian walk. As Christ has suffered, so Paul says, we will suffer. Now the person who walks this earth in holiness will necessarily suffer. Isaiah prophesied concerning the one who was to come. You know his words well, Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. That's the coming Jesus. But as we look at the Old Testament prophets themselves, we see, we see the embodiment of Christ-like suffering. Think of the prophet Jeremiah. For over two decades, he preached the word of God to the people of God, and it was like they had earplugs in. They never listened, and he suffered down deep in his soul. But it's in Christ that we see that ultimate model of suffering as Isaiah prophesied. Now his suffering is different from ours, but he still walked in death to the flesh. All of us know what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. A vivid picture is set before us of massive suffering before he goes to the cross. And it's by our union with this now resurrected Christ and our anticipation of conformity to that resurrected Christ that requires our present walk in suffering. And our suffering is not purposeless suffering. We're not suffering just for the sake of suffering. What's the end in view of our walk in suffering in the flesh, the end in view is nothing less 
than our salvation and the very glory of God. Now, when we stop and think about it, when we think about being glorified, 17b, we will be glorified with him. I know the school year has just begun, and I don't know all of you, but there's one thing I know about every one of us in this room. Not one of us is worthy of the glory that is coming. Not one of us can say, wait a minute, I'm a seminarian now. I've given up my good job. I deserve to be glorified. No, all of us. I mean, the reason that you are here is because you know you don't deserve it. You've been saved by grace. It's been freely given. And you anticipate that glory. And you know that you are unworthy. And if you don't know, see any of the faculty afterwards, okay? <laughs> we know that someday we'll be glorified. And reflection on that glory will get you through midterms. <laughs> Reflection on that glory is a key to our sanctification. So what happens between verses 12 and 13 and 17b? In between those bookends is what we call adoption. We receive the spirit of adoption. So let's take a look at adoption and the spirit of adoption. Verses 14 and 15. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Well, I'm a seminary prof, so I have to tell you there are some textual issues in these verses. You've got the word spirit three times. And if you have the ESV, you have two of them with a capital S, and one with a small s. So at 8.14, look at the, uh, the first Spirit of God. The meaning is clear when Paul says the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit who leads believers. But what about in verse 15? There are two times that the word Spirit appears. Now the second reference where it says Spirit of Adoption seems easily to relate to God's Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who adopts us. But in verses 14 and 15, we've got Spirit of God, capital S, Spirit of Adoption, capital S, but the middle one in the ESV has a small s. Now, sometimes Paul's use of the word spirit refers to the human spirit. And perhaps that's what he has in mind here, and that's why it's a small s. It's kind of difficult to imagine that the Holy Spirit could be described as the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, right? So maybe that's why it's a small s. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't ever produce fear or enslave, does he? Well, as a, as a result of these interpretive difficulties over the years, some uh, commentators have said Paul's language here is merely rhetorical, but they're incorrect. In fact, this is not a rhetorical function here in verse 15. There's a way out. There's a way to understand this. And let me give you what I think is the key. The key is to see all the S's as capital. It is the Holy Spirit who is in mind in all three references in these two verses. And the reason for that interpretation is what I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, verses 1 through 11. In verses 1 through 11, Paul is showing us what happens in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Then if you were to look ahead at verses 18 to 30, you would see a massive presentation by Paul of human history from creation to consummation, focusing on the epic of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, in Romans 8, Paul uses the word spirit 21 times. 
And the coming of the Holy Spirit means for him the dawn of a new age. The outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, which was secured by Christ's resurrection, confirms Christ's completed work. So the resurrection of Christ and the coming of the Spirit of the Pentecost is the beginning of a new age. A new age has dawned, dawned in Jesus Christ. So to speak as a seminary prof, the epochal informs the existential. The epochal informs the existential. What we have existentially experienced, what we should existentially experience, is based upon the epic of Pentecost. Our sanctification, our future resurrection, manifests the eschatological reality of what has happened in Jesus Christ. In his resurrection, we have been resurrected. In his bringing in a new age, the old age has passed away. We walk now in solidarity with the risen Christ. So seeing that we live in a new age, which is Paul's overall teaching here in this chapter, let's take a quick look at adoption and realize that it is both already and not yet. Paul has before us our adoption in Christ, and there's a dynamic and already and not yet, that's characteristic of Paul's eschatological teaching. In other words, the future that is to come must impact the present that we experience now. Paul teaches us, particularly in verse 15, that adoption is a present reality. Verse 15 of chapter 8 has the same meaning as another passage in Paul, Galatians 4, 6. Remember Galatians 4, 6? And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In our union with Christ, we have been set free from the bondage that we had to, and the slavery that we had to sin. We are heirs and children now, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children, and if children, then heirs and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we might also be glorified with him. So let me ask you, do you know right now that you are united to Christ? Do you know that you are a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? That you've been taken from the epic of death and corruption and placed upon the rock of salvation in Christ? Do you know it in your mind, in your heart, and in your soul? I trust that you do. You wouldn't be here otherwise. Yet adoption is not yet. We are not yet in heaven. I had that dream about black hands and white hands uniting together in prayer in my living room. And I am not experiencing that, and neither are you. But in heaven, John looks up and he says, I looked out and I saw a multitude that was not able to be numbered. And in what language? Every language. Everyone was represented, and they were praising the resurrected Christ. We are not yet adopted. John also tells us in Revelation 7, 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. We still hunger and thirst, don't we? Even while he was on the earth, Mark tells us in 9.3 that the disciples were able to touch the hem of his glory. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth, on earth could whiten them. John recounted that vision of the resurrected Christ in heaven. 19.12 
Can you see our Lord? His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows ex except himself. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine what it will be like when we see him face to face? When we see him in his resurrected glory? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we also shall be glorified with him. Amen. Our last psalm will be number 105a. 105A. Let's rise and sing together. <laughs>